Welcome to the Human Attachment Project and this is a class on boys and men and their unique vulnerability. And I want to put that in big letters because what I'm going to say today is paradoxical. How could men and boys be so vulnerable and yet men commit virtually all of the violence and perpetration on the planet? Doesn't make sense. But I think after you hear what I'm talking about, it will make sense. Girls are biologically more resilient than boys, and that is because they are created to perpetuate the species. So we have more girls conceived than boys. We have more boys that die in the womb, and more boys that are vulnerable at birth or die at birth or shortly afterwards. So if you talk to a neonatal nurse, a nurse in an intensive care nursery, she knows this. She knows that it's the boys that usually that she's most worried about. And of course we all know that men die younger and that as women take on more of the stress of doing the things that that men are doing, that women are starting to die younger as well. But generally men die younger. So, in order to create resilient human beings, they have to have their needs met when they're developing, but particularly in the womb, from conception to age one, during that period of most rapid development. Unfortunately, what most societies and cultures do is teach parents and the community, elders and everyone, not to give boys all that they need in the belief that it will toughen them up and that they will become stronger men. Toughen. And in fact, our myth is the strong, single, solitary, heroic male Remember the Marlboro Man on a horse for any of you who are that age? Um, who doesn't show when he's in pain, who can be brave in the face of anything and sucks it up. And you, you know this also by our language because we talk about boys who don't behave in a way that we considered masculine as sissies. So we, we, we talk about boys as sissies, we talk about boys as pussies. We use feminine, degrading feminine terms when talking about boys who are not b behaving in ways that we feel are appropriate for boys to become strong, tough men. It hasn't always been this way. There have been egalitarian societies and tribes and there have been groups of people who socialized boys to their own tenderness. I'm thinking of one tribe in Africa that where the boys were taught to make little mud dolls and to carry them and protect them. Or I'm thinking about Bali, a culture that has traditionally supported the tenderness of boys and praised boys when they shared things as little boys, praised boys when they gave someone their toy to play with. Our brain is designed to develop in a series of unfolding stages, each one dependent on the prior stages and each one dependent on the models around us. Now, some kids are innately more resilient than others. They just come into the world that way. And people will say, oh, well, you know, he came from a terrible background. He grew up in poverty, racism. He had all th sorts of things against him, working against him. But look at him. He got a PhD and he's doing just fine. Well, he may be doing fine in the outer world. We don't know what's going on inside. We don't know whether he is pouring out stress hormones and whether he's going to die young of 
looking so good and working so well and being so socialized to be the perfect male, or whether he's going to be someone who's fortunate in terms of heredity to live into his 90s. But we do know this, boys are from conception, innately, that's in the inside, more vulnerable than girls. They need to be breastfed longer. They need to be picked up when they're cried. Of course, when they cry, of course, everybody should be picked up when they cry. But when boys don't get what they need, and in terms of nurturing, in terms of nourishment, they behave more badly than girls, and they tend to lash out. And if they don't have the ability to lash out because they've been socialized not to show their feelings, then they will hold it in and the lashing out will be in the form of self-abuse or self-destruction. So the idea of the tough male is an old myth that dies very, very hard in patriarchal societies. And along with it is the myth of the solitary male who can do it alone, needs nothing else, you know? The stresses of modern life are very difficult on boys because they include not only deprivation often in their early years in terms of emotional deprivation, but also trauma at birth, born with a lot of drugs on board, born by cesarean, born after a very complicated pregnancy and labor, but also the toxins in our environment, which are stressful and release stress hormones. And uh, our environment has become increasingly toxic. So when we talk about boys, we cannot just talk about child rearing practices and what's going on in the environment. We also have to talk about religious values that we have had over many years of patriarchal rule. And those values, many of them, have taught parents that boys needed to have their feminine side, their vulnerable side, shamed out of them. And shaming has been a big tool in culture for a long time, and it's particularly nasty when it's used on boys. You should be ashamed of yourself. Are you still breastfeeding after all, you know, to a two-year-old boy who's nursing on his mom? Despite the fact that the world pediatric associations all say you should not wean a child at least until the age of two. In other words, stop breastfeeding at least until the age of two. We perpetuate the notion that what we are doing is spoiling our boys. So I, want, I wanted you to understand that because mothers of boys know that boys are tender. They're very dear, very tender, very loving when they're young unless they've had a lot of adverse circumstances in their lives, they show that. And they, they show that tenderness toward the mother, they show it toward other children. All of this has to do with attachment and the mother-baby bond and the fact that our first relationship, which starts at conception, is the mother. And we spend nine months in that universe, in this sea of her amniotic fluid in the soup of her hormones. And if she's in a stressful environment and she's not getting the nourishment and support that she needs, it passes directly to her baby, baby girl, baby boy, in the form of stress hormones. Stress hormones which are at particular stages of development of different organs very important to kick them into full development, but which when created in the mother's body and secreted too soon, too often, and for too long a period of time, stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, they actually act like toxins. They age the organ, they age the person, and they will cause an early cell death or an early death. So I mention this because you can't separate what we do 
to babies and boys from what we do to women and what we do to mothers and women as mothers. And in a society that has for thousands of years, perhaps as many as 8,000 years, the majority of civilizations in the world have been dominated by men with notions of the importance of the male over the female and over all other aspects of life, then it's very difficult to believe there's any other way to grow a human being. And yet there is. And we see it in some cultures. And we see it in some families. But by the time boys get into school, preschool, they almost always face shaming if they're different in any way. And it has a horrible effect on boys. And, you know, for centuries we've been telling parents that Babies don't feel, babies don't remember. And, and now we know not only is that not true, but that the human brain and its circuitry are wired according to whether that cell and every organ develops in a state of high stress, in which case it develops for defense, or whether it is allowed to grow fully. And when we develop in a state of stress, which is really what's happening to so many men and boys around the world, we can never grow fully. Now, we can remediate that with a lot of good things that we're learning in elementary school programs, in teaching kids how to go inside and contemplate, how to work with feelings, how to express feelings in ways that don't hurt other people but also don't stuff them. But it doesn't take away from the fact that we're still carrying the effects of having been deprived of the full nurturing that we needed as children. What healthy attachment looks like in a boy and in a girl is like this. It looks like being at ease in your body. It's like this little guy, Ira, who's with us today, Dylan's son. At ease in our body, confident, curious, spontaneous, able to feel and express joy easily, but also able to feel and express anger, sadness, fear, the full range of human emotions. And above all, perhaps, uh, as we grow, the way you see full attachment, the way you see resilient boys and girls, is an innate sense of compassion toward themselves that comes out instead of self-blame, self-hatred and altruism, big word, going for the highest ideal. I want to talk about the inner masculine and feminine for a moment because they're not gender-based. We all have within us parts of the brain that go toward art and music and parts of the brain that go toward linear thinking. So more circular thinking, more linear thinking, they have different purposes. We all have an inner feminine. We all have an in inner masculine. You can call it yin and yang. You can give it any number of names, but this is within all of us as men and as women. And what we've been almost systematically doing under patriarchal systems, and that's political systems, economic systems, business systems, is we've been making every effort we can to eliminate the feminine, to suppress it, to eliminate it. Look at the first things to be cut from school budgets. It's the arts. And yet art is absolutely critical to the development of the human heart, to compassion. It's gotta go. We'll have athletics before we'll have art. We'll take out dance. We'll take out reading literature. Not saying that science and math aren't very, very important, 
But in the absence of art and literature, they often end up not serving the highest interests of a group of people, a community, or a society. And what the masculine side of our brain and the masculine principle is really best at is service to the highest good. So we've put men in charge of governments and women trained to be manlike, when in fact probably the feminine and women who have that intact would do better in positions of power and men better in positions of service. We see how, unfortunately, but we see how well men go into battle to serve a high ideal, a noble cause. Unfortunately, that causes killing other people in the name of whatever, land, resources, many different things. But it's really misguided because the highest service is the joy of people, the happiness of people, the health of people. So what all babies need, but few get enough of, especially boys, is a low stress pregnancy. A mom who's really calm in pregnancy for the most part and well supported and nurtured and not having to be distracted and anxious about what's going to happen after the birth because she has to go, she feels she has to go back to work within weeks because there's no daycare, because she's separated from her family, grandma can't take care of the baby, <sighs> afraid of the birth, maybe she was born under stressful circumstances and she carries that on into her own pregnancy. Maybe she's not even planning to breastfeed or if she is, everything works against her successfully breastfeeding. If she has drugs in labor, it makes it more difficult for her to breastfeed for the first days. The same with cesarean birth. And yet more and more women are having those. Only 20% of babies in North America are fully breastfed. In other words, exclusively breastfed, nothing else, six weeks after birth, and yet they need it exclusively for at least six months. It's not that women are to blame, it's not that men are to blame, it's that the society is designed around linear thinking, productivity, domination, suppression of the body, control, manage. Just look how we deal with the earth. I can remember a time decades ago when the Army Corps of Engineers was called upon to deal with the flooding of little streams in neighborhoods. And instead of building far back from the streams, which would flood once in a while, people thought it a great idea to build right next to the stream. And so what the Army Corps of Engineers in many towns and small cities were doing was paving the streams and rivers with cement completely destroying the ecosystem, but it, it had a logic to it. If it's flooding, well, this will prevent it from flooding. We'll just cement up the sides, you know? Unfortunately, it didn't take into account all of the other things, the peripheral collateral damage, as it were, to the ecosystem. So what happens when we don't give boys enough enough holding, enough cuddling, enough rocking, enough soothing, enough picking them up when they cry and not letting them cry it out, is, and then shaming them, is we get what is called brittle men who really can't handle adversity well and who've been socialized to only a few acceptable behaviors. Stoicism, anger, depression, but not showing it, addiction, work addiction, any kind of addiction. And we wonder, women often wonder why men aren't more able to express their feelings. Why aren't they in touch with their feelings? Well, they would have been. I mean, given the fact that there's different brain structure between boys and girls, um, they would have been had their full needs been met. But when you're dealing with someone who is in a culture that believes that if you 
deprive boys and toughen them up, you get better men. What you get is bullies and weak men who act out violently or violently toward themselves. The number of suicides among teenagers that are predominantly male, you know, is one of the facts. The good news in all this is that we're beginning to name it. We're beginning to understand the special vulnerability and sensitivity of boys and men. And we're beginning to put in place, oh, wonderful little programs in elementary schools to help kids feel their feelings, name their feelings, reflect on their feelings, allow their feelings in their body, but give them ways of expressing them that aren't going to hurt other people. So we're doing a lot of this because we're finally understanding human brain structure and the special needs of boys. However, it's going to take more than that. It's going to take changing our political and economic system so that it is not based upon products and productivity. It's not just a matter of women being paid, you know, 75, 78% of what men are paid. It's a matter of nobody being paid for doing the job of nurturing, for caring for a sick elderly person. It's about the fact that those who care for those who are dis differently abled or for kids who are really tiny get paid the least. And that shows where our economic thinking is. Years ago, actually it was 1988, a political economist named Marilyn Waring wrote a book, If Women Counted. And it was looking at the economics of valuing the work of women the same as we value the work of men. Today, with there being much more gender fluidity and the fact that men are staying home to rear children, women are sometimes able to earn more money, so dads are being home, or for a variety of reasons, we're pulling men into the nurturing of kids. They're feeling more support for this. I would call it economics as if the feminine mattered, as if all those activities that took care of a home, a family, young children, and the earth mattered. That's a, that's a lot to take in. So this book still sits on my bookshelf and gathers some dust. On the back it had quotes like, Iconoclastic, a call to politicians, policymakers, economists, and everyone who might possibly be interested in, understand, protest at, and overturn male world economic assumptions. Well, that was, came out in The Economist, 1981, but nothing's really changed. Waring has succeeded in rattling to its very foundation the statistical scaffold that supports most of the world's economic structure. How many years ago was that? Oh, systems that are not effective die slowly. And we're having to face, as we face the challenges of modern life, many things that are happening in the world that require new ways of thinking and new ways of doing. From our dependency on gas and oil to our not cutting down the rainforests, our dependency on eating cow meat, cattle, which has taken so many resources from the earth and is really not sustainable. These things die very hard and with them, the way of life of the cowboy, the way of life of the men who work in the lumber industry. And we fight it tooth and nail because we humans are habit-bound creatures, and it's hard for people who have not had their full needs met early in life to even have a full sense of imagination and imagine that there might be different ways they could earn a living. 
and to create an economy that would be training people for different jobs as old jobs become unsustainable. So all of this comes under the category of this big word, patriarchy. It's not a word most people know or think about. And I'm at suggesting that if we want to really make a difference in the world, we're going to have to treat boys differently. We're going to have to name the violence that men perpetrate. And oppression is a form of violence. Colonialism is a form of violence. But shaming is a form of violence. And when it's done on boys, it's particularly disastrous. The good news, as I mentioned, is that as we understand the developing brain more and more, as we understand neuroscience and cellular biology, epigenetics, the, the way in which it's not just nurture or nature, but it's in fact what turns our potential, our genetic potential on or off and causes it to express or not express in that particular human being which is stress and how much of it and adverse things like toxins. As we learn more and more about this, then we have the ability to do something about it that we couldn't do when we were just dealing with it with feelings in our gut, feelings in our heart, which were accurate, but which society taught us to suppress and not listen to. So here's a case where science is validating the human heart, is validating what our own instinct is as parents, to pick up children when they cry, especially babies, to feed them from the breast, to organize a work system that does not require a woman to decide whether or not she's going back to work or going to nurture her infant, to not penalize a man for choosing to be the primary caretaker of his child. And I hope that while it's sober talking about this, talking about the vulnerability of boys and the brittleness of most men, I hope that this gives us all pause for thought, reflection, thinking back in our own lives, and looking at solutions economically, politically, in terms of our, our work lives, and our home lives to make things different. Thank you. So I've asked two men from two very different generations, almost three generations apart, to come and listen to this and give me your feedback. Dylan, how old are you? 26. And Bob, how old are you? 65. Okay. And how old is Ira? Ira, how old are you? One. So what that I said might have either touched you or given you some thoughts? I think what's very fascinating, you mentioned epigenetics and uh, in the work that I do with kids, there's a lot of trauma in their lives. W um, what's the work you do? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm a restorative justice coordinator for La Plata Youth Services and I used to do um, youth advocacy and case management for youth who are involved in the criminal justice system. Um, actually trying to pull them out of the criminal justice system so they're not really involved. Um, and so they don't really have to see as many courtrooms. And if they do, hopefully it's only one courtroom and that's it. Um, so we work with a lot of um, at-risk 
but also I would say high need. And you mentioned needs, um, having needs met. And I think that's very important, not only from, uh, you know, when you're in the womb and after you're born, but also throughout your life. Um, yeah. And I think so often um, kids' needs aren't met and, and um, a lot of their needs and them voicing their needs is, is uh, squashed. Well, you know, the stresses are getting to girls and boys and the lack of nurturing is showing up in girls as well, plus all the violence that they see on in movies and on the internet and the fact that they're not getting enough sleep and they're on Facebook all the time and the quality of their relationships has in many cases really diminished from all the electronics so that you know we went from face-to-face -face contact to phone to email and then to texting Mm -hmm. And now to texting as briefly as you possibly can, losing virtually 90% of the subtlety of communication. And, uh, and, and this shows, as does the toxins in the environment and the toxins in the womb, whether the mother was a smoker or had alcohol or whether she was eating food that had a lot of toxic chemicals or whether the dad in the weeks before conception of this baby was under a great deal of stress. We now know that the dad, dad's health in the couple of weeks prior to conception um, can epigenetically alter the sperm so that it's more likely to result in a child with a larger hind brain, an ancient brain, which is built for survival and defense. Very necessary, but not the way to live in community. Right. Yeah. How about you, Bob? Well, I, I think what we're talking about really is a, a profound disrespect for childhood from conception, preconception, all the way up. And that lack of respect um, what creates disconnection. I have a strong suspicion um, from my own work that children have um, at birth a connection to something very basic and wise. And the socialization process has um, a terrible side effect of disconnecting kids from that wisdom. Um, the choices of a child are extremely limited. They can either rebel or exile. But when you're two years old, that, those aren't options. You're stuck. It's a rock and a hard place. So you're in for a penny and for a pound as a kid with a family of origin that doesn't respect your connectedness and your own sense of wisdom. And the family is smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, where you used to have auntie and well. grandfather and all of that going well, on in the extended family, now you've got maybe one parent. So the older traditions speak to that wisdom. And perhaps the best people to transmit that are elders as well. Right. And to a large degree, elders have been kind of shuffled into the assisted living, um, the Silver Ridge, the Golden Meadows. <laughs> <laughs> and before you know it, they have very little to do with child rearing at all, yeah. let alone passing down the wisdoms from their, um, their own childhood as well. And sadly, a lot of uh, grandparents these days weren't connected as parents. As a result, their wisdom is not there. It's been diluted and somewhat contaminated in a very large way. Right. So they have. They really need help in healing their own uh, belief system that they grew up with. You know that you let a baby cry it out. That you shame a child for you can't do a not worse behaving thing to right. A young boy. Exactly. Or a girl for that matter. But a young boy pays for it dearly. Uh, Dylan brought up something about there appears to be more girls moving into. Um, the need for restorative care and into the, the, the justice system. And I'm certain that has a lot to do with drugs, but I'm also um, convinced that it has a lot to do with the masculinization of the feminine. So, yeah. The more we beat feminism down, the safer patriarchy feels. And it's Say more about that. The more we beat feminism down. Well, um, patriarchy relies on a hierarchical um, system of people higher than the one, uh, you know, above and below and below and below. And power below. over. It's, right. a, it's a power over um, scheme 
Um, anything that gets in the way of that, in this case, um, feminism, or the feminine, the divine feminine, uh, threatens the integrity of this notion of how things work. And the patriarch has a very different idea of how the world works than what a feminine um, culture would have. Right. There's two different notions going on in there. So anytime we have arts, anytime we have um, anything that might even look like it's soft, screams of vulnerability. And a vulnerable male is a dead male. So we crush the feminine. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's can in survival. Order to falsely magnify the masculine. Right. So what we have now is a hyper real masculinity um, going on with a war culture that is now spouting um, a continuous war. If it's not Afghanistan, it's Iraq. And if it's not Iraq, it'll be someplace else. Seem to have a need to really go into the depths of hypermasculinity in order to feel safe. Right. When in fact, that's the wrong direction to go. It's right. counterintuitive to right. allow the feminine, the divine feminine, to begin to reawaken in each one of us men. So, in your lives, um, doesn't look like you're a typical male in terms of how you're caring for Ira. Where did, would you say you are or not in your generation? And if so or not, who were the models that you grew up with for not getting angry at Ira when he drops a pencil or... I think it's, um, my dad raised me that way where it was, uh, I mean, my dad was a Marine in Vietnam. Um, he was wounded in Vietnam. He's suffered, I'm sure, from PTSD um, throughout the majority of his life and never spoke about it and, and, and will not talk about his experience really. I mean, he will talk a little bit about it, but that's, it's really hard for him. Um, you know, he can't be around fireworks on the 4th of July. Um, <coughs> and my dad is very, uh, always high stress and any little thing is like a, a trigger. He was never violent towards me, um, unless <laughs> I was violent towards him. <laughs> um, that's a, that's a whole long story in and of itself, but he was never really violent towards me. Um, I have great respect for him, and I also can see that it's very deeply ingrained in, in men and boys, I think, of how to act. I mean, it's a very strong social construction of masculinity, mm -hmm. what, we're, what we have to um, conform to and to in order to be a man so who were the like, yeah who were the models that showed you you could do it differently um i would say that um my brother devin was he, and he also i mean we all can see our our how how we conform to that and how we try to fit that mold we do it very subconsciously it's not always a conscious thing like i'm going to be as masculine as I can be, it's really kind of, it, it just, it's there because it's so normalized to, to be that way. So my brother was always, he, he instilled some of that same, you know, same um, patriarchal drivers, I would say. You mean like yes. stoicism or? Yeah, well, um, to be, you know, to, to try and be tough. In, in huh. one sense, but he also really listened to my needs as a kid, and my whenever I had a uh, had a fight with my parents or got in trouble at school, he always came to talk with me about it, huh. and it was never a lecture. It was always he was always very um, he would listen to me, and I think that's what we lack a lot, and uh, so the the people who really helped me kind of be who I, who I am. Um, really listened, I think, to to me and and allowed me to express myself. And and there were also other people too who helped me to think differently. Um, I have a bachelor's in sociology. That my hmm. experience in college and my education uh, was totally different than what I got when I was in high school. Um, 
you know, and uh, even what I got from the media as growing up, um, I, I never really had put so much thought. Um, I was still very conscious of things that I was angry about or upset about with how we structure ourselves and, and all the various social constructions and molds that we have to fit into. I was always kind of an out, outsider, I always felt different. Um, never felt like I was one of the, I wasn't very athletic, I wasn't, um, you know, I didn't want to be those things. I was very artistic, I liked music, um, and so, um, you know, my experience in college really kind of helped me piece some of these things together. And So you're really living proof that you can educated. shift. Yeah. Oh! <gasps> And I would say, you know, I'm never, I don't think anyone's perfect. Um, I think I, I continue to struggle with parenting and what it means to be a good parent. And I think stress definitely plays a huge role in that. Um, when I was doing case management, there were, there were times that my dad, my father would come out in me and I was not always the best parent. And I, you know, I'm, I haven't always been the best parent. I'm not perfect, but... Um, I've been able to strive more towards building stronger and positive relationships with my kids and um, I think that's very important. I don't think we're, I don't think we're taught to do that. I don't think we try to do that and I think um, that's really the work that I'm trying to do is, is to show adults that we can build better relationships with kids and, and that kids' voices matter. Um, and that when we don't listen to, to kids, that that is when um, there is that disconnect and they, they aren't able to, to deal with things that are going on with them in a healthy way and then jump to coping mechanisms that may be violence, that may be drugs and alcohol, that may be a, a whole plethora of things. You know, you mentioned screens. I think screens are used too much. I think we try and limit as much screen time as we can with our kids to have those connections. Um, it's been showing to have a detrimental effect on kids. And I think that our economic system, our the technology that we're exposed to on a daily basis, that kind of forces us to be disconnected. We no longer have to greet someone at the supermarket if we want to buy goods. We can go through the self-checkout aisle. Right. We can buy things online. It's very quick and very immediate satisfaction. And I think we're taught to have that immediate satisfaction and to want to buy more things. And and it's drilled into us in a on a daily basis with marketing that kids are exposed to. Uh, my stepson Bo, he's he's seven years old, goes to public school, um, and in relating to you know my concerns around capitalism and our disconnect and and all the technology and the kids aren't reading books anymore. We're not talking with each other mm -hmm. anymore. We're doing online school. We're doing all these things that are just very rapid paced and not connecting and not even allowed to really breathe or take time. Uh, so we're so rushed. He was sent home with a Scholastic book calendar and most of the books on there were uh, just marketing tools for toys, for video games, uh, man manuals for video games. Really? And, um, and this is the stuff that, you know, that our kids are getting in public, you know, our education system is, um, is buy this book to support the school and the book is really teaching them to, that they, you know, need to buy more video games. <laughs> well, it's like naming the baseball right. field after the uh, product, right. Coca-Cola, beer. Or, I, yeah. I, I love video games. I play video games, but I also see a need for um, moderation and reintegrating and having more time to communicate and... 
Um, I don't think kids are getting that, and that's why I try to I try to strive to to do that for my kids and for the kids that I work with. And, and nature. I do. And, I mean. And nature, and, and nature is huge. Getting outside. Um, you know, we don't do enough of that. It's really something that we need to do, and I think schools need to do more of that instead of sitting under fluorescent lights and taking tests. Mm -hmm. I think we need to have more kids outside learning about the world and what is the, the, the world around us. We focus very, very little effect, almost zero attention on that. Other yeah, than we call recess. it nature deprivation. <laughs> right, and well, and recess is, is, is now what, 20, 30, 20 minutes maybe, if that, if you get that time. And, and you're confined to this area, you're not, you know, it's on a soccer field. I just think that we need more time to explore the world, more experiential education, more uh, acceptance of people's um, talents and needs instead of compartmentalizing and, and you know, boys right. need to be doing this kind of job. and. Um, you know, if you don't know how to do, if, if you don't know how to uh, do construction or how to do these things, then then you're not, a, you know, you're a pussy or whatever. And it, the kids are fed that all the time. Um, I mean, it's funny, I think, uh, we do it on a daily basis. We see someone's hair length or something and, or ponytail and we think automatically that it's a girl mm -hmm. yeah. and I don't even correct people you know anymore like I don't I don't correct people when they're like you know oh she's so cute he doesn't have he, he doesn't he, care he doesn't yeah. care so, no and I really don't <laughs> yeah, but on when the other gets to a, when he gets to an age and he really wants to say well I am a boy and that's and and hopefully it's it's it'll be accepted and I think it is more accepted these days to have long hair but as growing up as a kid Bo experienced that on a daily basis and on the bus getting teased for having long hair and how that's a girl thing to do and we we never made Bo cut his hair uh, we never said Bo you need a haircut we're gonna give you a haircut we left it up to him to choose to get a haircut if you wanted a haircut. Well, you know, I'm, right? I'm, I'm right. thinking of little boys who have buzz cuts and who are in army fatigues for <laughs> toddler size <laughs> or in foot football outfits and football jerseys for mm -hmm. Iowa's age. I mean, that's a socialization. Or G.I. Joe. Or G.I. Joe. I mean, it's a socialization right from the get-go. And then the little grocery carts in the grocery stores that are chil oh, child sized groceries routine. so that they can learn how to be good consumers. <laughs> first, at first glance, it looks like, isn't it nice to do a child centered thing? And then you realize, well, what we're really doing is teaching them to be consumers. Uh, well, I think the notion of nature and how important it is for kids is, needs to be looked at pretty carefully. Why are we trashing our environment to the extent that we do? And the better question is, why are men? Um, primarily responsible for trashing the environment on such a massive level, from global warming to endocrine disruptors in the environment, you name it, we're in serious trouble. There's a huge amount of uh, discussion among, at least in some feminist groups anyway, that nature embodies the feminine. Nature itself um, is life itself. Nature will produce a seed um, with the, the every intention of, of nurturing and making that and giving that seed every opportunity to grow. Nature doesn't make a seed, a life, unless it intends to do everything it can to nurture it. The outward signs that we see of patriarchy is that it's so terrified, and they did this in the medieval times as well, they're so terrified of nature because it embodied the wild, uncontrolled feminine. Mm -hmm. um, and that had such a huge impact down the road, it led to variously thousands of women burned during the burning times, up to perhaps millions um, as well, because they were so well connected naturally to the earth, the environment Terms. around them. Wiccan religions, which are earth-based religions, are primarily feminine. Um, and everything that we do 
to try to beat down the feminine really kills the earth one more step to oblivion. So honoring nature is honoring the feminine. Honoring the feminine is honoring the masculine. And we've got to be able to keep those three things in line because if the earth and women are givers of life, and they are, then men should be serving that life. And sadly, because of their vulnerable physiology, um, they're given too many roles of incredible responsibility that they don't have the emotional stuff to manage. So as a result, it's abused. We see torture. We see genocide. We don't see this being done by women. We see this being done by uh, brittle men who have lost con contact with that essential being within themselves. It's the great forgetting, and that's what socializing is. Right.